Hello, and how are you doing? I hope uh, this summer comes in good news very soon to ourselves in Canada and everywhere in the world. My name is Jamal Al-Sharif, and uh, this is the political show on Canar TV, the Arab voice from Canada. As we know, the federal election in Canada, most probably coming soon. All the speculations say that the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will go tomorrow Sunday to the Governor General to ask her to dissolve the Parliament and call the election. There are many calls uh, and many speculations say that the election will be around September 20th, which is which means that will be a very, very short period for our candidates to prepare themselves and knock all the doors in their ridings. So we have this on ourselves in Canar TV to bring as much candidate as we can to introduce them to the community and to know more about them. Today, our second show, and today we have a very nice and gentle, nice lady, you don't call gentle, uh, Madame uh, Bisan Al Zobi, Ahla Sahla, welcome. Hi, Marhaba. Thank you for having me today. Bisan, it's very nice name. So uh, we are very proud that Bisan is uh, from the Arabic communities. She's running in uh, Kitchener Center. Kitchener Center for the NDB. Uh, a very uh, uh, high voice, especially we've heard the NDB is doing great job during the pandemic, uh, trying to push for a lot of reforms. So uh, Bisan, uh, first questions as usual, who is Bisan? Hi, marhaba, thank you again for having me. Um, my name is Bisan Zabi, Bisan Zubi, if you're speaking English. Um, and I am, um, as you mentioned, the NDP candidate here in Kitchener Center. Uh, but before that, I am an equity trainer. So I work with local startups and nonprofits to help them become more socially responsible and work on you know, sustainability, diversity and inclusion, um, equity. But I work with boards of governors uh, generally. That's what I do for, for work. Uh, before that, I, I worked on Parliament Hill, actually, um, when I was young, when I was 25, 26, 27. And so... It's interesting the idea of coming back in this in this way um, for sure. I'm excited on that. I'm also a Palestinian Canadian. Um, my parents live in Ottawa, Canada. Um, my older brother lives there as well with his wife and his sister and my nephew, who is three. Um, and I am, you know, I'm a community. Uh, I'm very engaged in the community. I volunteer. Um, I am an activist, and I try and get. Uh, different types of uh, municipal changes done. So I've been a housing act advocate for a while here, especially when it comes to affordable housing and homelessness and poverty. So um, I, I, I've, I've been very busy, but I'm very, very excited. And, and I think, you know, we're having, as you said, uh, the likelihood is that there will be an election called tomorrow. So I think that I'm just, you know, one person in this community that's also really um, you know, I don't necessarily think it's the right time to be having people going into an election. Um, I know that I'm making sure that people from my team are, are double vaccinated and making sure that they're, you know, taking every single safety precaution. But also, you know, we have had a really, really tough couple years. And I think we have, a, we have an opportunity to demand better from our government and to really say, what we think a better future looks like and to have our leaders be accountable to us. Because for the last couple of years, I think we've been very, um, I think we've been very, we've been very patient. We've all been kind of coming together um, to try and make the best of a really difficult situation, right? But as we rebuild and as we regrow, we can we can start demanding, you know, directions and, and, and visions for the future beyond this. Before we jump to the community, to the politics, I want to know more about your involvement in the community. As you yeah, say, sure. poverty, uh, housing, uh, many non-for-profits, involvement mm -hmm. with... So what did you do for the community before you start uh, to be a candidate for the next federal election? Yeah, for sure. So I moved to Waterloo Region for work, like a lot of young people, um, over 
I think maybe six years ago, um, and I worked at CG, which is the Center for International Governance Innovation. And so that is on, you know, on Herb Street in, in Waterloo, but a very um, prestigious research institution. And that's where I started learning more about the community and really started going to community events and, and making my friends. But when I started working at Communitech, which is the local incubator, the tech startup incubator here in Kitchener Center, like just a couple blocks away from my house and my campaign office now, um, that really shaped the way that I worked with the community because my job at Communitech was I actually connected the tech community with nonprofits, with philanthropic opportunities, with volunteering in the community, and I helped the tech um, you know, tech uh, companies, startups in the incubation space, but also very large companies engage with the local community better. So that introduced me to a lot of local charities and nonprofits that I still work with. So, you know, Reception House, um, who greet government assisted refugees um, and help place them and settle them in the region. Um, I, work, I work with um, the KW Multicultural Center. I'm an English language uh, tutor there with a, a Syrian refugee who her and her family came and settled here. So my Arabic helped me um, teach her kind of more of the, of the English grammar and, and, and conversational English fundamentals. Um, I was nominated for the uh, KW, uh, the Chamber of Commerce's uh, Young Professional of the Year Award a couple years ago. That was that was a nice honor. And also the Arab Women of Waterloo Region Award, too. So there are a lot of different kinds of community groups, but everything has always been very much about just, you know, meeting people where they are and finding issues and causes that, um, that you know, matter to them and matter to me and, and working together on them. Uh, yeah. Sounds good. So why did you uh, join the NDB party? Why this particular party? Why not other ones? Well, I started actually working for the NDP. It was my first job after I graduated okay. from undergrad. Yeah, so I started working for the NDP when I was 25, um, when I graduated from Concordia. And so it's always been the NDP for me. Um, I'm a progressive person. I believe in the state and like our system protecting people and lifting up the vulnerable. And so I don't believe that the things that we hear about like trickle down economics and, and us and, and people benefiting from, um, from just, you know, corporations, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in that. And so I really think that um, it's always been the party for me in that kind of sense. And I think that right now, just with where we are and the questions that we're asking for me, um, healthcare is a really, really big issue. We need to invest in our healthcare, affordable housing too. Like these are my, these are my core issues, and and the NDP is the party for those issues. So that's you know it's it's a natural fit for me. Yeah. Uh, Isan, if you're winning, and you will be the representative as a member of parliament for uh, water uh, for Kitchener, Kitchener Center. Center. Yeah. What uh, what do you think you can do as a member of parliament for this area? I mean, a lot of things, right? I think, but for me, the point is, and why I'm running with the NDP and why I think this moment is so important is what we can do with people across the country who want these changes, right? I mean, me as one solo person, one person alone, I don't know what I can do. I don't think it's about me. I think it's about um, a v like a vision for the future that is collective and that really is voices across the country. And so I'm excited that the NDP has candidates that are, you know, indigenous activists that are, you know, small business owners that are immigrants and refugees. Like they have all these experiences that are so missing from policy, from building good policy, from knowing how it impacts people and knowing how government can actually, um, you know, change people's lives for the better. This is the lived experience, right? Um, and so I think that that's really where politics becomes interesting and, and um, powerful and can change things. So um, I think that as a younger person, I have a lot of kind of experience with um, things like, you know, like when, when I'm like, so I was renovicted, for example, from my apartment in January. I was living in the same apartment for a very long time. 
and then it was sold. The new owners want to make a profit on the building. And so everybody who lived there, all seven, you know, different apartments, we were all evicted. And so we were evicted from our affordable homes so that somebody could who bought it um, and would put money into it would make the homes cost probably twice as much on the market after. And so that represents the loss of affordable housing. It, it, it says that people who are in the community are then displaced and where are they going and, you know, where can they afford to be? I was lucky enough to find another apartment, but many people have not been lucky. Many people have had to leave our area, right? And so having experienced that, I think is very valuable for somebody who's actually writing policy on housing. And if you have always just lived in the same place and been secure and always, you know, never wondered or never worried about that, you're missing experience uh, that many Canadians have. Like that is a very important experience that you would be bringing to the table. But we look down on those experiences. Yeah. So I think that that time for that is over. You know what I mean? Like we we can do much better now. So I, I, I think that there's people like me. There's young people everywhere. Um, there's people with experiences, there's, um, you know, racialized people, poor people, um, people who have, you know, different ways of thinking about things. Those, that's how we'll get things to change in Ottawa, just not having the same one mindset that we have right now, which is the real problem. Uh, as we know, this is one of the hardest election. It comes uh, after the pandemic and during the pandemic. Uh, so nobody's actually liking that it's coming within very short time, uh, as, as we've heard that it's uh, around 20th of September. Uh, it's very short campaign period. Uh, all the restriction, mask, uh, you can't talk to people, close. We're being very safe. How challenging? How challenging this? It's pretty challenging, but you know what? Like we're a very we're a young campaign anyway so this is our first campaign so it's kind of like we're learning how to do this from the get-go anyway so it's a part of what we're learning and so it's not necessarily i don't think more challenging than running for the first time you know so we're we're doing that and we're just adding this too this is our new reality um we don't really have an option so we're just going to do the best we can so we have rapid screening tests that we got from the Chamber of Commerce for canvassers. Um, we are only, at, we're asking that everybody who is canvassing be double vaccinated. So just make sure you're taking every precaution before you're knocking on people's doors. Um, we have, you know, our sanitation station before you walk into our office. We have rules on, you know, who's there. We're contact tracing, all of that. It's, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. And it's, it's, not necessarily, I don't think this is a great time to be having an election. I don't think it's safe. I know that the numbers are rising and, um, and, and I think that we need to just do what we have to do. You know, I don't want anybody getting sick on my behalf. I want to keep everybody healthy, everybody safe. Um, and so I'm hoping the other parties are going to be doing that too, because there's going to be a lot of people out do knocking doors. Like we're just one kind of group. There's, you know, four or five parties in the race here. So, um, least, you know, so we have to be careful and, and we're, we're very vigilant. We're going to be vigilant, but it's definitely a concern for us. Yes. It's a concern and challenge. I think it's it's never been like this, and uh, I hope it will be the last time we go through this together. Yes, yes me too. I really hope. Yeah. So tell me about uh, Kitchener Center. You're riding, you're running in. In general, uh, how yeah. many? Uh, what is the population? It's it's around one hundred thousand. Yeah, it's one hundred and two. It's gen yeah. Um, Kitchener Center is is a wonderful riding. Uh, it's really diverse. Uh, it's got a lot of different. Uh, communities, but a lot of different types of like neighborhoods. It has very dense kind of urban neighborhoods. It has, um, you know, just beautiful, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have the Grand River that that um, is one side of our riding and, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful trails and nature. Um, so so it's a it's a really lovely riding like that, but it's quite small geographically. It's like a very small urban area. Um, it's uh, it's changing. It's changed a lot. 
in the last couple of years. Um, if you look at housing, if you look at new developments, we are like every new building being built in downtown Kitchener is now taller than the last one. And we're looking at like 30, 40, 40 story buildings in a city that never had anything higher than like 12. So it's definitely changing very rapidly. And I think there's a lot of concern about how it's changing and what we're going to change into and how we can change into something better and not you know, worse in that self in, in that something is more exclusive or, you know, people can't live here. They can't afford to live here. Like we don't want it to turn into that. So um, Kitchener Center is also very young. It's a very young riding. The majority of the, ri the riding is under the age of 40. And so um, a lot of us are workers, uh, you know, young professionals, whether we work for ourselves or others or tech companies or in services or uh, as creatives, uh, there, there's a lot of young people too. And a lot of young families. Yeah. So uh, do you know the percentage of the Arab and Muslim in your riding around the, the person? I, I believe um, it's around like, uh, like, I don't know what the percentage is, but I believe there are about 5,000 Arab speaking people or Arabic speaking uh, people in the riding. And I'm not sure about the Muslim population, but it is also, I would say, probably um, much higher than that because um, there's a, a much larger kind of Muslim community. So I think it's something around three or four percent but I would have to check, but it, it is quite significant. We have uh, the Kitchener Mosque. Um, uh, there are uh, like the, the uh, you know, we, we have, uh, there's a Guru Dwar, and it's, there's a very diverse kind of community that um, goes all the way like through Kitchener and Waterloo region. And so um, it's changing too. It used to be quite, you know, homogenous, but especially Syrian refugees have come, um, I think, I think 3,000, 3,500 um, all throughout the region. Uh, so that's not just in Kitchener Center, it's also Kitchener it's Conestoga and South Hespler. But a lot of like, there's a, there's a sort of a wonderful Syrian community here and many of them were joining family that were already here. So um, it's only growing. So yeah, we have a very, yeah. Uh, Pisan, you've been looking doors for several weeks so far. Since and July, you've, yeah. you've, you've, you've talked to people in your riding. What is the feedback you're getting from them? What do you hear? What's their concern? Yeah. Um, people want things to get better. They want things to change. Like even some people were working the entire time through the pandemic and, and from not just from home, like going into work every single day. And, and a lot of those people said that they felt ignored because they, you know, weren't able to just pull themselves out of out of harm. And so, um, you know, just dealing with that and, 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 and kind of dealing with um, the harm, the trauma of the last couple of years, I think is going to be really big. We had, you know, a hotspot in, in, in our riding. Um, we have both, you know, around the hospital and then as well in the south of the riding where racialized workers, you know, who often work in the factories that again, didn't close. Um, you know, we're there. And I, I hear a lot of young people who want to stay here and whose jobs are here, but they just don't think they can afford it. You know, they're wondering, like, their rent is going up. They want to buy a house. But the house, the price of housing in Kitchener went up $200,000. The average price of a house in Kitchener went up $200,000 in the last year. One wow. year. And that has just completely kicked a whole segment of the population out of the housing market. The biggest so, segment, I would uh, say. Oh, and it's also, I think, doing something to young people psychologically, if I'm being honest, because we, I mean, our parents and, and, and older generations had at least these things that they could strive for. You know what I mean? These kinds of benchmarks and goals that, um, that, that they were told that if you do, you know, you go to work, you do your job, you can have these things, right? It's a house and a family and like, uh, a pension and a retirement. And those things are not a reality for people my age. I am 100% aware that the CPP is not going to last for my retirement. It's not going to exist, but I have been paying into the CPP since I was 24. But I'm well aware that it's not going to, it's not for me that I'm paying into. And so I think that we, I hear a lot of that. I hear a lot of just um, people want a, a new direction. People want things to change and not just like in incremental and really small and kind of surface ways, but they want us to kind of rethink the way that we do things, the way that we, that we treat people and treat our lives. Yeah. I, I was reading statistics before uh, preparing for the show 
And uh, I've seen that in Kitchener now, you need to be earning around 100,000 K a year to be able to buy a house, which is like- Which is uh, over uh, twice the national like median average. Yeah. average. Like it's, it's completely unattainable. And we do have, you know, and we also have people coming in from Toronto now who during the pandemic hadn't really needed to be living in Toronto and realized that their rent is so much more expensive if that's all they're kind of getting in, in a downtown Toronto unit. And so that's also inflated the, the housing prices here. It's people coming from other cities, but it's also pushing people from these cities away. And so we need to find a way of just making a city and have enough space for everybody. And there is, right? We like everybody deserves a home. Everybody should have a home. We can do that. We can give a home. We can have a home for everyone. Completely attainable. We just it's we don't because because people don't care enough. You know, like if we wanted if it we wanted it to be a priority that everybody in Canada was housed, it would cost less than what we you know spend on prisons and the military. Easily, you know what I mean? It would. But we like don't. It. So what's that to tell me, you know? Yeah. Uh, buying, I think, one of these fight, uh, fighter uh, jet, jet fighter yeah. could, could educate uh, our youth for years. Yeah. So that is a yeah. uh, challenge. And it's, it's priorities, nice. right? What it are is. our priorities? You're running for the NDP. Mm -hmm. And the NDP became more popular recently because of their platforms. So people talking about the NDPs, uh, the leader, uh, why the NDPs are uh, getting closer to the youth, to the workers. Tell us more about the NDPs and about their platforms, please. So the New Democratic Party um, actually was founded through um, a like a deal between the CCF, which is uh, which was a socialist party from the prairies, and um, labor, and and so workers helped found and create the NDP. So that created the foundation of care, of, of realizing that a lot of the work that's done in our, you know, in our society is from people who are ignored and who, you know, if we look at Amazon, for example, and we see how, you know, th those Amazon workers worked throughout the pandemic. They were going into an unsafe, like a war zone every single day. And they, you know, we didn't get any kind of clarity from them and that kind of stuff. And so when I think about that, that, that to me is the point of the NDP, but the point of unions and the point of protecting people, vulnerable people from being used and from being exploited, you know? And so that is the NDP to me. And so that's kind of the roots. If you look at what the NDP has accomplished um, they have, you know, they're the reason why we have healthcare in Canada. Um, and I think that we are going to keep being the ones pushing for these, you know, progressive policies. So right now in our platform, and it's been in our platform for a very long time, and the Liberals promised it in 2015 and then broke that promise, but pharmacare, like there's no reason why people should be paying an arm and a leg for their prescriptions. Some prescriptions are up to thousand dollars a month like uh, higher than that um for people who are very very sick and it's just we we're supposed to have this health care we have taken it into yeah yeah I mean, like our our self identity that we have health care and yet it's not complete it doesn't help poor people like um you know women uh, uh, pay for out of pocket for so many different kinds of health care expenses. So health, pharmacare is a huge one, but like mental health, the mental health of our country has been just plummeting, especially in the last couple of years, but it was already in a really, really bad state. We don't cover mental health services. We don't have a mental health strategy. If you go to the doctor, um, you, I mean, you have to pay, you have to wait. There is, you know, we don't have that same kind of level of care. And so we need to really firm up our kind of healthcare system, especially as my parents are, uh, are turning 70 this year. I know a lot of other millennials, our parents are getting old and they're, they're the boomer generation and they're a very large generation of people. When you have an aging population, you have more healthcare demands automatically automatically so you know long-term care health care aging care all of that stuff is so so important to start investing in right now before we're at that critical 
hot, like, you know what I mean? That critical mass level where, you know, it's, it's a lot of, 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 of old people and we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the like ability for people to stay in their homes and get medical treatment in their homes. That's when we're in a real crisis. And that's maybe 10 years away if we don't start investing right now in healthcare in Canada. Uh, I know that uh, there was a report uh, by the Commonwealth Fund uh, that Canada healthcare system rank second last among 11 countries, uh, just one before the United States, which you is... Know. And, and like, we I, we do have a very, you know, we, we, we have an accessible general care system. It's great that, you know, if something emergent happens to you, um, you can get care. At least, yeah. But it's 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 a start. Like we just we just can't settle for it. We have we to keep to pushing, and we need to be better. And so the federal government sets the way our country does health transfers. That's coming from the the top. So everybody who says, well, the province, the province, well, the province receives billions of dollars from the federal government. So very much it is the ver federal government that can say, this is what we need. This is what you know. These are our priorities. This, this is what this money is for. And, and have those kinds of results happen at the provincial level. They just need to that, make that money available. I know the NDB also fighting for the dental and vision care. Dental, yes, exactly. Like we need to be thinking about, you know, dental care has a, extreme implications to our health. It has implications to our ability to earn money. If you're missing a tooth, like it's very hard for you to get a, you know, get a job at a restaurant as a server and that kind of stuff where it's vision and appearance and, and that kind of, you know, those types of things are very class oriented. And, and so if you can't, you know, fix, fix those things, it's, it, it actually holds you back in life as well. Like and so, yeah. yeah. So it's, it, these are, these are really, you know, um, it's your head, you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand like your brain, it's your teeth, they're, they're your eyes, they're right inside of your head. Of course, this is healthcare. Of course, this is fundamental. Um, I get asked a lot, well, how how will we pay for it? You know, how are you going to pay for it? Again, That's we talked my... about the priorities, though. We talked about how, you know, we're spending $17 billion on fighter jets, and then that's going to cost a lot more over their lifetime um, than just that. And and for what? Like, for NATO obligations? I, I just, I think that we need to think about how are we creating a, an intelligent, you know, you know, healthy um, and resilient yeah. economy in Canada, um, but not, you know, not just doing things for the sake of them. And, and yeah. I think that we are not a fighter jet country, you know. University education, it's yeah. became college, university, it's became a headache and a burden on a lot of youth, especially after graduation, yeah. a lot of depth. I've heard like people paying uh, the debt for 10, 15 years of yeah. their life. And now buying a house became a science yeah. fiction, not a dream. Yeah, it's affordability. Became... Well, it's like for young people, how are they going to, you know, how what are they going to reach towards, right? So uh, are the NDBs trying to do something with the education? Yeah. So we have, I mean, I think that there's always more to do. And I'm, I'll say that about literally every issue. But for, for, for tuition, what we've done is debt relief. So up to $25,000 of tuition debt will be forgiven. And that will change a lot of people's lives. But it's not everything. You know, we also need to be making sure that we are helping, you know, people get into school too. And so what are we doing for making sure that, um, you know, uh, under advantaged people, like that tuition is not that barrier for grants and, and like a national grant system. But really for me, I think, and this isn't necessarily where our platform is right now, but I think that if we are putting education, post-secondary education as um, a necessary thing for people to do to be able to succeed in the world and in the economy, it should also be accessible. So it's very expensive and that's not like, okay, so whether it is free, whether we have completely subsidized, we need to really be reimagining this education for profit model because uh, it shouldn't be about a profit. It should be about preparing people to make the world better and like use their skills effectively in, in, in our economy. And so we want that. We benefit the more people who are doing that and the more kind of talented, you know, productive people we are actually pulling in 
to, you know, to creating and, and making things better, the better, the better for everybody. Great. Uh, Bisan, if we see you as an MP tomorrow, well, I mean, when it comes, uh, what will be your priority? As we know, every MP has uh, mm -hmm. to introduce a bill or he can introduce yeah. a bill. What do you did, did you start thinking about this? What bill do you think you can introduce? No, to the I market? should be honest, I haven't thought about that, but there was something that I have kind of thought is that when I was younger and I worked on Parliament Hill, it was a very unhealthy environment for young women. Um, I was a young woman, I was 25. Um, I was sexually harassed by members of parliament. Like it was not a safe environment for women. And a big thing for me going back is making it safe for women and fighting for it being, you know, parliament held being a place for racialized women, you know, um, uh, young women, older women, uh, but also not just women, but people who are vulnerable, who are excluded from places, right? Being Palestinian was also really rough on Parliament Hill. It was not fun. I was told, you know, hide yourself, hide that part of you. And so oh, yeah. all, I don't, I don't think they would have said that to somebody who maybe had a bit more stature. I think they would have just kind of, you know, not, not, I don't know, maybe, all that to say is that it just wasn't a safe space. And I know that for a lot of other women, it also wasn't a safe space for them. So I think that if I am being honest, I think I might try and do some kind of legislation about um, like an anti, you know, like an actual anti-harassment and um, a gender equity policy for Parliament Hill. Like which, four legislators on Parliament Hill, which that'd is be, important. We, we've, seen, we've seen we've uh, seen an uh, MP woman MP uh, in last uh, election, and she she resigned because she was harassed, mm -hmm. and she's indigenous. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, a lot of women in politics have a lot of a lot of harassment, and right, we're getting it from everywhere, from social media, um, from you know, from people. But I don't think we should be taking it in the workspace of parliament hill like cit canadian citizens are paying members of parliament like a lot of money to do a specific job and when i was young i go on the hill and i see these very powerful people abusing their power um i see them not working it's their staff that are underpaid who are doing all the work and it's these people who are then coming in and taking the credit and having the photo taken and i you know you see all that when you're young and it kind of shapes you into thinking why well, first of all i would not do that like i would do it better but second of all like this is not a system that people would want to get into you know what i mean like we have to just change the system and and i think that really electing people across Canada that are different, that have been in different positions and have known what it's like to not have power, to, to you know what I mean, to be powerless. I think that is who we really need to be thinking about um, bringing into, you know, bringing into these conversations, bringing into, you know, creating um, legislation creating new policies because right now it's the same people who are in power thinking about how power works and it's just the cycle continues and it's the status quo and nothing ever changes because power doesn't want to give up power so we need to just you know we have a democracy this is when we use it we use it to change this we use it to and vote and to you know change and it. that's what we encourage people to use their power because yeah. as, as I always say, people power is stronger than people in power. Yeah. So if we go and vote for the right person yeah. and put the right people in the right place, we will see a prosperous Canada because that's what we need, especially during this hard time. After yeah. this COVID, it, it's, it's very hard for any government. So Bisan, maybe uh, you spoke or you touched on Palestine. This is one of the most... Uh, important subjects i would say to many uh, arab in in the community in canada uh, canadian arab and for you as originally from palestine where you are standing on this issue what do you think you can do for uh, to to resolve this problem as as a canadian politician for sure so again um one person i want to be a part of a movement of a collective action for peace i think that peace will come from the generation i don't think it'll come from the governments i don't think it'll come from 
um, you know, the Israeli or Palestinian governments, if I'm being honest, it will come from people. And so I would like to be part of the people who are, you know, pushing for uh, a peaceful solution for everybody. My family all lives um, in mostly in Israel proper within within those borders. And then I have um, some family in Ramallah in the West Bank. And I visited and, and I've, I've, I've visited back home, but I was born in Toronto. And so I'm Canadian and, and, and I have that kind of duality as well. And I think that being able to kind of share that Palestinian experience from a Canadian perspective is something that hasn't necessarily been seen in Canadian politics. So I'm excited to be able to be the one to do that. Currently, I'm the only Palestinian running in all of Canada. So um, it's a lot of pressure because I want to make sure that I, you know, I I, I keep pushing for this because it's who I am and it's my identity and it's so many people's identity and it's so important to so many of us. So I'm not like shying away from talking about being Palestinian. I just think that the peaceful solution has to come from so many people and it has to be collective and it has to be um, solidarity among, you know, different, different causes as well, beyond just Israelis and Palestinians as well, like speaking to indigenous communities in Canada, like settler colonialism is, is at the root of so many different kinds of horrors and traumas around the world. So we have to have an honest conversation about what that means, right? Like why we support some governments and not others and why some governments get away with, you know, really horrible, horrible crimes. And we kind of call them something else. And we, and we look at them a different way because of, you know, imperialism, colonialism, like we recognize them more than we recognize, you know, other, other, other nations. And so I think it's all related. Um, I do equity training. And so I really do try and think about how they're, about how um, these issues do work together, how they intersect. Because I mean, from a policy level, I think it's really important to look at like the different implications of the policy. So foreign policy, for example, like members of parliament, I have, a, I'm, I'm very in, like interested in Canada's foreign policy right now. We have a terrible foreign policy right now. Yeah. It is disgusting. And like, we don't talk about it enough. Like we don't talk about our support for Saudi. Like we don't talk about the really dirty, ugly things that Canada like does. We became enemy to everybody. Everybody, <laughs> it's just a short period of time. And like, we, 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 we try, like, I think I grew up, you know, 90s, early 2000s, where you would have that Canada patch and you would put it on your backpack and you would want to go all around the world and show people that you're from Canada and they would say, Hey, Canada, the like, you know, <laughs> that, like we had that review. That is, that is not the case. Right. Like, and I, and, anyway. and it's, it's, we don't have that anymore. We have lost and Stephen Harper started it. I will give him full credit for his work. He is the reason why that reputation tanked, but Trudeau hasn't repaired it. Trudeau hasn't gone around the world and, and, and actually made Canada into an ally, into a supporter. He's made it about, you know, himself and, and us and about what we can do. Canada is back. But where, where did we, where are we? Because yep. we haven't really been showing up and we are looking the other way on a lot of things. So okay. yeah, we need to work on our foreign policy. My, my, my next very important question is Islamophobia. Uh, okay. After yep. the Quebec attack, uh, London attack, several attacks on uh, hijabi women in Canada, Islamophobia became real in Canada. Yeah. So well, where are you standing on this? I mean, I, okay, so Islamophobia. I, my father's Muslim, my mother's Christian. They were not allowed to marry. Um, both their families forbade it and they kind of moved here. And so I grew up within the context of also being within those two kinds of worlds. And even just seeing how that has like played out with my father's experience of life, the way that he is treated, the way that, you know, Arab men, Muslim men are profiled and, and terrorism has affected them specifically, like that my brother and my father are, are, are like hesitant to travel and don't want to connect, you know, through, through different kinds of places. And all of that, I think, is um, related to the ability to villainize just like Muslim people and Arab people and, and, and having that, I mean, obviously September 11th was just a huge moment in that because I, I was 15 
I think, at 14, 15. And I remember I was, I had my first, you know, racist incident right after that, you know, and it was really, really hurtful and traumatic. I remember how, you know, people were saying, don't, you know, don't say, you know, who you are. I know that my, my hijabi friends were um, very, very scared. One of them had her hijab yanked down on the bus. It's, there were so, that's, so to me, Islamophobia is, is not new. It's been happening and it's been growing really, really hard since I think that to me is the catalyst, September 11th, and the way that the U.S. and the way that Canada and the Western media allowed it to be, you know, Muslim terrorists, this kind of line. So that framed, I think, a lot of, you know, what I what I experienced after that. So I went to Montreal and that's when they, I also like was, was in Montreal at the same time as their reasonable accommodation kind of, uh, I guess they were not trials, but they were like uh, commissions. Um, and then that was talking about what is reasonable to accommodate when it comes to religious, like, you know, religious kind of um, um, imagery. But we know how that ended up with uh, like, you know, the public service hijab ban in, in Quebec. And so these are all related and they all grow. And what we really need to understand is that Islamophobia isn't just cultural, it's institutional here in Canada. We see our institutions passing it on through their work on, you know, CSIS with anti-terrorism. And, 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 you know, if you look into the Mar Arar and, and, and um, all, uh, uh, Omar Qadir, like, we have had very Islamophobic policy coming from the top in, in, our, in our government. I was on Parliament Hill when they first introduced the um, barbaric cultural practices hot, like um, uh, uh, bill and, and, and the liberals voted for it. The liberals to, who are there today voted for it. And so, you know, I mean, it's know. been a long time. And I, and when so when people are talking about what happened in London or even when people are having, talking about what happened in Quebec City, we knew, we knew that we had a hateful culture. And the fact that people still haven't woken up and that we still haven't really changed the way that we talk about the Middle East, the way we talk about Arabs, the way we talk about Muslims, um, the way that we keep using the word terrorism, like it's a knee-jerk violence equals terrorism and that that doesn't help muslim people that doesn't help arab people by normalizing the usage of the word that was held against us and used against us it's not a good thing for white people to be called terrorists too because it just means that the next time a muslim person an arab person is called a terrorist we're going to be more familiar and we're going to know that that guy was so we're going to go harder at the muslim guy i, I don't like I want us to break away from using the traps that we have had put on us. So for Islamophobia, we have to think about anti-Arab racism and how it kind of um, impacts all those levels. But then we need to think about anti-Black racism and we have to think about how that compounds with Islamophobia. And you know what I mean? And, and that's a whole other experiencing of it. And so it's racism, it's oppression, it's all connected. We can't pick and choose and we can't just, you know, only we have to talk stand about against, one. We have against to stop all of them, all of yeah. them. Yeah, I agree that's with the only, That's the only solution. We can't just look at Islamophobia and pretend if we only work on Islamophobia that it'll help because they're all the one, black, all the Jewish, control. the indigenous, yeah, everywhere. And anti-indigenous yes. racism and, and like Palestinians, like we have that solidarity with Canadian, um, uh, with, with Indigenous people in Canada, because we have that kind of a settler Indigenous uh, understanding, but that's solidarity and that, that's a good thing. It's not just about us, that's all over the world, right? And so when we find that, I think that's when we can really start talking about the ways so, that we are held back and the ways that we're oppressed, you know? Yeah. Pisan, you're wearing today an orange shirt. <laughs> Is yeah. it because the NDP or the indigenous? I would like to ask this you what an, this is. This is my, I, I will be honest, this is an NDP dress. Um, we we had to, so for our volunteer t-shirts, um, we ordered them back in July and we knew that there were yellow, orange t-shirts and they meant something, um, you know, to the indigenous populations. And so what we did was we ordered white t-shirts and then we tie-dyed them like different colors. Oh, that's good, that's good. Yeah, so that's, well, that's, we just, that's my we question. Knew, 
Well, we wanted we're standing to, on the indigenous rights. Well, it means something, and it means something specific. And we kept seeing all of these orange T-shirts all over, you know, the city, and we liked it. And we didn't want people in their head thinking, "Is that indigenous or is that B Sands campaign?" Like, I don't want people wondering. I want them to know it's support for indigenous children. It's important support for reconciliation and truth and justice. So when we wear our shirts, nobody can, nobody's making that mistake. Nobody's thinking it's the same thing. They look very different. So where do you stand on the indigenous uh, rights? As we know that every every government trying to make reconciliation. However, how uh, my point of view, how you can make a reconciliation with people that you don't know, you don't understand, mm -hmm. you never been with, you never yeah. talked to. So where do you stand on this indigenous rights and what do you think the NDP can do to 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 really go to the reconciliation and truth? Well, so I think the first, you know, the 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 commission was truth and reconciliation. And I don't think we've even really handled the truth part yet, right? So I think that there really needs to be a, tr a, a reckoning of the truth of what happened, of, you know, um, of those lives that were lost, of the culture that was suppressed, who did what. That stuff is very, very important. Nice to meet you, Haifa. That stuff is very important because it helps us um, understand where to go because if you don't understand what has happened if you don't understand you know the past actions there is no reconciliation like so that is not a start and that's why we don't have reconciliation because we still haven't come to the truth part right the fact that when we started discovering um you know dead bodies on schools and people were shocked and dismayed when this was published explicitly in the Truth and Reconciliation Report like three years ago, shows that like it just didn't really, you know, capture people when it happened. So I think that the truth part is very, very important. Um, and then I think that once we have um, acknowledged more truths, understand, understood more truths, then we can actually start to understand and listen. And then that has to be the next step for moving forward because and then we have to understand what they need and, and, and how and how that works. And so one thing that we are hearing a lot is land back. And that is a very, very reasonable request in my in my in my eyes. Um, we have promised land in especially at Kitchener Center and that we took back like this is there are so many different documents that show, um, you know, how 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 that history has gone and we as a government like we don't even negotiate with with those land deed owners as as we call it. like you know what i mean and so i think that we have to be harder on ourselves if i'm being honest like we i think we're i think we're being too easy on ourselves i think we kind of allow um our you know oh those those things happen in the past like we can you know, we can move forward. No, we st until we understand the past, until we have accounted for the past, we can't move forward. Then, yeah, yeah. There's I no agree. moving forward. Uh, Pisan, you are running a campaign, a hard campaign. As we know, uh, every uh, campaigner, every politician who trying to uh, get into the parliament need help. So yes. can you tell us what help yes. you need from the community to be able to become an MP and deliver the help to the community later. So first we need to help you, yeah. then we we will expect you to help us later. So exactly. I mean how, it's reciprocal. Um, how people yeah. can help you in your riding or in Kitchener in general. Um, there's a lot of different ways to help. Right now, we are just getting ready to like campaign. So that means every single day we will be out knocking on doors and making phone calls. So you can come if you're in Kitchener and come knock on doors with me and with our team, or you can make phone calls even from home. We have a call-in system that you can just do from a computer or even from your your cell phone or, or your your landline if, if you want to. And we do those calls every day, every evening. Uh, to do outreach. And so you can ask to, if you speak Arabic, you can ask to speak to, um, a, we, we do Arabic language once a week of just Arabic kind of speakers reaching out to people in the local Arabic community as well. So we've tried to make it as accessible as possible to get involved in that way. 
Um, and there's also fundraising. It's a it's a really difficult part of a campaign because I hate asking for money, but we have to buy lawn signs and election signs and they cost so much money. So, um, you know, even donating 10, 20, however much that you can afford is really, really helpful because it helps us um, like compete with ex like very established campaigns that ran just a couple years ago we we didn't we're new so we have to buy everything from scratch and so we you know they have their signs from last time we need to buy new signs and but just to remind, also, yeah. remind everybody that the canadian system is uh, up to 400 dollars. they yeah. give you 75 percent back yeah. when you file your tax so basically if you donate 400 to be signed today uh, you will get 300 back, so it's actually... I, you went for the, I went for the 20, you went for the 400, but it's the case up to 400, yeah, it's 75% back. So there's an extremely generous, like, this is why they want you to donate, they want to encourage it. So basically, if you donate before and these the election are very expensive, on this campaign, believe. you'll get a tax receipt in early 2022 from the NDP Kitchener Center um, uh, EDA that will be for 75% of the donate, donated amount. So then when you file your taxes, if you donated $400, you get $300 back. If you donated $100, you get $75 back. So it's a very generous system to, to help, to encourage people to donate. So, so that volunteer really donation. Yeah. And so my website is bsanzubi.ca. It's my first name, last name, dot C-A, B-E-I-S-A-N-Z-U-B-I.ca. And um, there's a little donate button in the top corner, um, and you'll see all of that uh, information there. Um, and, yeah, you need to be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, but um, I, I, I believe many of you are. Um, but it's – there you go. That's my website. You'll see me with my hair down, my hair pretty, when I haven't been out in the sun, <laughs> walking around and sweating all day. Yeah, it's, that's what I look like when I'm <laughs> – when I'm a bit more put together. Uh, yeah, so that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so just click on either of those two buttons. That'll take you right to the donate page. And um, you can also get in touch, ask questions. We we definitely, any kinds of resources, you can help us. You know, some people have cars and they can help us, you know, um, take people to the votes or take people to canvases and door knocking. Um, you know, some people are really strong and they don't really want to talk to very many people, but they can help us put the signs and hammer the signs into, into the lawns. And so there's a role for everybody, um, you know, every skill set, every um, time, you know, time commitment that you can make. We really are people powered. We have a really excited team of people like we. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are very uh, young and motivated and we got a lease for um, a storefront on Tuesday. We signed it on Wednesday. We painted on Thursday and Friday and then we moved all the furniture in today and we did it. And now we have a campaign office and we're ready for tomorrow, you know, and so we just get things done. We're a very motivated team of people, but um, we have hope, but we have hope because we're, what do we, you know, I get asked sometimes, um, what do you do? Well, so what's next for you if you don't win this? And the fact of the matter is that I don't have anywhere else to go. Like, this is the only planet we have. Like the next, I don't, I can't go. I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Richard Branson. I can't go to the moon. I, this is the world that we have. This is the climate that we have. This is the economy that we have. Um, I'm here to, we, we have to make it better. We have no choice. So whether it's this election, the next election, whether it's in between, whether it's through government, outside of government, that, that, that's unknown. But I think that the point is, is that these are all things that we have, that we need to do, that we need to, as a country, to focus on. And they're not going to change. They're only so going to get more urgent. From our listeners would like to help, wherever you are in Canada, you can come and donate online. You can call and donate by credit card. They will help you. Yes. If, if you are in Kitchener, it doesn't mean if you are in the riding or other places, you can come and volunteer to help. Uh, Pisan uh, in her campaign. Yes. And the most important, if you are in Kitchener Center, go and vote on the voting day. That is the key of everything. And honestly, uh, I even, you know, vote for whoever you vote, but be active, ask questions, go out, learn more, because we have as 
as voters a responsibility because when we don't participate and we don't um, you know, make our voices heard, we have, the outcomes are just worse for us. They just get worse and worse and worse. And it's not wrong. Like, I mean, it's not um, an, a, abnormal to feel like disenfranchised from the system. It's built to make you not want to be a part of it. Poor people, racialized people, young people vote at a much, much lower rate than the rest of the population. And it's because they don't think that the system cares about them or that their vote matters. But the reason why the system is allowed to keep ignoring them and allowed to keep ignoring their needs is because it just gets to repeat every election while young people don't vote anyway. Yep. You know what I mean? They're not gonna show up, so their issues don't matter. Um, and, you know, it's time I would for, like to talk to you more for an hour, for another an hour. I know, I'm but sorry, I can keep going. We are, we are running off the time, so your last message to all Canadian, yeah. uh, the Canadians in your riding, and to everybody listening to us. Just thank you for the support so far. There's so many more opportunities to give support. Vsanzuvi.ca is where you can find all of the information and get in touch with me. But no matter where you live, now is the time. Now is the time to ask those questions and get involved. So I hope you do. And I hope that, you know, with an election, it's a chance for us to really demand a vision for like a better future. Yeah, that's my website. Thank you so much. Yeah, so the website is on the screen and it's in the comments. So if you would like to help Bisan, just go to her website, donate today, uh, do not be shy. The Canadian system has a very generous uh, giving back if you donate for a political reason. Seven, up to 75%, that's a great number, you know, it's like almost... It's easy. very, I know, when I told my friends, they're like, is that? And I was like, yeah, I know. It sounds like it's too good to be true, but it, it's the way it's always been. So take advantage. So, Bishan... Uh, at the end, I would like to thank you Chukri. for being brave, for giving us the hope and to uh, run this election as a woman, as a, a woman from uh, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, Palestinian I'm woman, you can Palestinian, say it. Uh, I'm Arab. I, I, I'm proud of you. And I think everybody from our listeners are uh, listening and learning a lot. So thank you again for doing whatever you're doing. We hope to see you soon in Ottawa. Uh, congratulate you with, the, you with your new office, inshallah. Uh, just to remind everybody that we will have another episode tomorrow at 9 p.m. with the liberal uh, candidate Gustav Roy uh, running for from uh, Ottawa Carleton. So be with us tomorrow at 7, uh, at 9, sorry, 9 p.m. Uh, thank you again and uh, wish you all the best. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody.